they care about control and they care about moving toward their like weird white nationalist Disneyland future that they've envisioned for America. But now that Disneyland is woke, we're going to have to use another different uh, comparison because they remember they removed all the wenches from the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and it made that man in Las Vegas very sad. So sad. he had a, a wench free experience on a And children's you know, I ride. love the Pirates of the Caribbean and I don't even remember the wenches, which means they were not relevant to the They're experience. not that important a part. It's no. not wenches of the Caribbean. Yo ho ho. So there's some news this week. Once again, the news continues to happen. Alyssa. Doesn't stop. It doesn't stop. And I, it occurred to me this week that a lot of times when we get into the news, we're like, well, everything sucks again. And I kind of wanted to try something new this week. I wanted to start on a positive note, right? Okay. Let, like, let's get people. Is there feel- one? That, let's get people feeling good. Right. Okay. If we can't okay. be positive, look, let's like, at least get people feel like they could run through a wall, you know? OK, I'm all for running through a wall. OK, listen to this. Professor Bridges, you said several times you've used a phrase. I want to make sure I understand what you mean by it. You've referred to people with a capacity for pregnancy. It, would that be women? Many women, cis women, have the capacity for pregnancy. Many cis women do not have the capacity for pregnancy. Um, there are also trans men who are capable of pregnancy, as well as non-binary people who are capable of pregnancy. So this isn't really a women's rights issue. It's a, it's, we can it's recognize a that this impacts women while also recognizing that it impacts other groups. Those things are not mutually exclusive, Senator Hawley. Oh, so your view is, is that the core of this, this right then is about what? So um, I want to recognize that your line of questioning um, is transphobic, <laughs> um, and it opens up trans people to violence by not recognizing that. Wow, you're saying that I'm opening up people to violence by asking whether or not women are the folks who can have pregnancies? So I'm one, I want to note that one out of five transgender p- uh, persons have attempted suicide. So the sound you heard is an exchange between, I'm sorry if you recognized his voice, but Missouri Senator Josh Hawley and University of California at Berkeley law professor Kiara M. Bridges. And that was during a Senate judiciary hearing on the legal repercussions of the Supreme Court overturning Roe v. Wade. Alyssa, what do you think about Professor Bridges? I was for it. She was just not going to let him get away with it. She's like, nope, nope, this is who you are. And she called him out for who he was, and it was delightful. She was so fearless. I found it to be very inspiring how fearless she was. It is. It seems like an intimidating place to be, to be in front of a Senate panel, in, in front of a, a Senate subcommittee or a committee. And she was just not afraid. She was just no. totally not afraid at all. Um, the there's a there's more to the clip that you can hear. You can find it. We'll put it in the show notes. Um, but she eventually is sort of it. The, it sort of devolves to her being like, maybe you could learn something if you took my class. And he goes, <laughs> <laughs> and he's like, I bet I would. And she's like, you would. And he's like, I bet Fine. I would. I bet I would. <laughs> Fine. <laughs> it's still not going to take it. Is this how you run your classroom? Are students allowed to question you, Absolutely. or are they also treated like this, where no, you, no, no, they're, they're told that to they're at, opening up people to oh, violence? We have a good time questioning. in my class. You should join. Oh, I bet. You might learn a lot. Wow, I, I would learn a lot. I've learned a you, lot just in this exchange. Absolutely. Extraordinary. Yep. <laughs> he was what they call bested by he her. Was he, he was bested. He was bested. What a good was, old-timey word. Yes, he was He was bested. Um, and that was a, a really great clip. And I am jealous of everyone who gets to take Professor Kira M. Bridges' class at UC Berkeley Law. I think that that would be a really interesting and informative class. And I mean that with sincerity and not in the way that that Josh Hawley means it, which is in the most snotty, asshole, dweeby way. Um, Okay, so you feel like running through a wall? Yes, of bad news. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, so last time we recorded a couple weeks ago, we asked listeners to send us news from their respective states. Since now we're, we're in the, we were in the era of, Stakes rights. No, states' rights, not stakes' rights. Stakes' rights is when you're a Supreme Court justice and... <laughs> oh, but I'm bump. <laughs> and you're no. at the... And you're at Morton's in D.C. Mort out of all the places. Of all the gin joints in all of D.C. Morton's. They went to Morton's. He's Jesus. like, I want, I want meat and I don't care how it's prepared or if it tastes good. I just want... <laughs> 
a hunk of meat. Uh, that should be on the Morton's signage. Hunk, hunks of meat. The Arby's of steak. The uh, <laughs> Sorry. I'm only roasting Morton's because they they released a statement about how a Supreme Court justice has like the right to eat dinner, which is very funny. They did? I thought they said he couldn't come back. There there was like the right to eat <laughs> dinner was in like a statement about like oh, being, the which right is to eat dinner. Is that true? If there's a right to eat dinner, Aaron, I feel like we could really put Morton's at the forefront of the uh, food insecurity problem. Uh, well, if there's a right to eat, it, I feel like the the Kavanaugh way would be like, if you smell dinner, you must eat the entire dinner or you can be legally prosecuted if you do not take the dinner to its conclusion and finish the entire dinner. Um, anyway, this is this is a whatever. Um, OK, so we're in the era of states rights state and rights. state. So that means. Where you live within the U.S. will determine whether or not you have access to reproductive health care. And in a lot of places, the most right wing anti-choice people are very emboldened by the Supreme Court decision in Dobbs and are coming out like crazy. Busy. Trying, they are busy. busy trying to pass laws to make abortion illegal for the people that live in their respective states. Alyssa, what state do you want to start with in our, I think we're calling it our tour de bullshit. Tour de bullshit. Let's start off with the Keystone State, Erin. And you know what's so funny? There's so much bullshit. I had to like write it down on notes because Ooh. there's so much bullshit. So in Pennsylvania, the old General Assembly is up to some some really destructive antics. What do they want to do? All of this potentially could come to fruition in the uh, primaries in May of 2023. They want to require IDs to vote. They want to require auditor uh, auditor generals to audit elections. They want to allow gov- gubernatorial candidates to pick their running mates instead of having them be elected. Um, they want to expand the General Assembly's power. This was a real good one, Aaron. They want to expand the General Assembly's power to reject regulations. The fuck does that even mean? Like, what the fuck does that even mean? And, and, you know, the coup de grace, as they say, is that they passed a bill last week actually for a state constitutional amendment that would say there is no constitutional right to an abortion. So that is what is going on in the Keystone State. Ah, you know that Pennsylvania. I'm I'm a Pennsylvanian in law. My in laws are from Pennsylvania. You're all the states, dude. You are all the states. I just I you know what I it feel weird saying it, but I really do like many aspects of America. I think that it's a beautiful country, and I visit a lot of places. And and you know what is we have crossed over so many places, so many of the same places. You're from Wisconsin. I went to school in Wisconsin. We both lived in Chicago, and we're both in law in Pennsylvania. Oh, yeah. Pennsylvania, the husband state. The husband state. <laughs> well, uh, not so much anymore if they actually make it. No, nope, like, do this. Nope. Yeah, nope, 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 nope. 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 And that, that state is is really gerrymandered all the fuck. Like, you know, yes. it's, it should be it should be a blue state. The Pennsylvania General Assembly, Assembly is so gerrymandered that it's really hard for Democrats to get any foothold at all. And so the gubernatorial race in that state is massively important. Um, I guess keeping in line with the general character of the GOP nowadays, uh, Pennsylvania has nominated an actual maniac to and, run. And- actual maniac he is an actual maniac um and but nobody should become like comforted by that oh they're running a maniac no 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 maniacs get people excited maniacs get other maniacs excited and i mean lauren bobert marjorie taylor green these people maniacs are winning places yes like lunatics really bring out the lunatics and any sort of complacency will allow people to kind of allow the lunatics to take over. So uh, Pennsylvania, you have to you have to pay attention to what's going on in Pennsylvania. Um, Alaska is uh, Alaska. Not as many people in Alaska. 
Uh, it's not as much of a cross section of America as Pennsylvania is, um, but the right to abortion is protected in the state constitution's provision on privacy, which was voted in by the people and recognized by the Alaska State Supreme Court in 1997. But their governor now wants to do away with the right to privacy which he announced on the day that Roe was overturned. His name is Mike Dunleavy. Of course it is. Of course it's a Dunleavy. If but- I were writing a character that was like a shitty governor in Alaska, that's that would his, that's what his name would be. Mike or Skip. I mean, I but like if you're a GOP person, how do you – how do people get on board? Just getting rid of privacy. It's just privacy. Do GOP people not want privacy? Like at all? I feel like if you went to – a lot of them. And you were like, okay, you don't care about privacy. Show me your search history. They would understand pretty quickly. Yeah. Maybe that, that's the tactic, Aaron. Yeah. We're going to we're gonna expose everybody's search history. Um, mine are mostly about plagues and uh, true crime in history. Um, okay. <laughs> Tennessee's got some hot percolating trash. Uh, Tennessee has nullified the age of consent for marriage. Aaron, that Um, means 14-year-olds can get married. This is my air quotes. That's rape. That's not. 14-year-olds. Not. 14? Okay. Look, if you are a political party that gets people motivated to, to vote by lying to them about the other political party grooming children, perhaps the best move just politically just just purely politically, we're not even talking morally. Politically, maybe it's a bad move to make it legal to marry children. Just saying. I it mean, it didn't just saying. It seems seems like is that really the hill you want to die like on? The real groomer is the Tennessee state government. They're the ones yes. doing the grooming. Good oh, Lord. Oh, and also let it let it not be. Let us not pass over the fact that they also want to turn homelessness on public property into a class E felony. Okay. Hmm. They care about life, Aaron. I don't know if you've heard. The GOP cares about life. Uh, no, they don't. <laughs> uh, um, okay, let's, uh, they don't care about life at all. They care about control and they care about moving toward their, like, weird white nationalist Disneyland future that they've envisioned for America. But now that Disneyland is woke, we're going to have to use another different, uh, comparison because they remember they removed all the wenches from the Pirates of the Caribbean ride and it made that man in Las Vegas very sad so he had a a wench free experience on a and you know I love the Pirates of the Caribbean and I don't even remember the wenches which means they were not relevant to they're not that important a part it's not wenches of the Caribbean yo ho ho I mean, whatever. Um, Okay, Utah. Utah, one of my favorite states. Uh, I know, but they're doing you dirty this week, Aaron. Utah, one of my favorite red states. Most beautiful state in the U.S., I think. Utah, New Mexico. Two beautiful states. Utah is doing poorly in terms of how it is best serving the public health interests of its citizens uh, compared to New Mexico. Uh, poor New Mexico. They're going to be so overwhelmed with people from the surrounding states that are just enmeshed in fuckery that it's just going to be, they're going to be overwhelmed. And I, ugh, my heart goes out to poor New Mexico, partly because of Utah. Okay. A GOP lawmaker says that she trusts that Utah women can control their intake of semen as mm. the state's trigger law has gone into effect. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm going to just read the full quote. Uh, Utah Senate President Stuart Adams is the person, of course. I don't know. All of these people's names I know. like. You know, this, this all right goes name. back to the time we played about, we played around with old Supreme Court <laughs> not justice names. I they know. all come back to haunt. They all come back. I know. I know. This is, this is definitely a Felix Frankfurter type name. Okay. <laughs> so the full quote is from uh, Repre- Representative Carrie Ann Lisenby. Mm -hmm. Who should know better. Carrie Ann, as far as I know, is a name that is not given to men. Uh, Carrie Ann said, I got a text message today saying I should seek to control men's ejaculations and not women's pregnancies. I do trust women enough to control when they allow a man to ejaculate inside of them and to control their intake of semen. What? Aaron, that's hot. That is, you know, you know what that is? It is. It is on par 
with should we round it out with a fuck that guy? Should we should we round it out with the great state of you know South what? Carolina? S- somebody, well, just real quick, I just want to oh, yeah. I want to riff on Representative Carrie Ann here. <laughs> Does she think? I think that she has me confused with a duck because ducks, female ducks, can reject male ducks. I mean, they have like trick what? vaginas. Yeah, they have like trick oh, vaginas. Girl, it's- your search history is lit. <laughs> Female, it's true. Female ducks have trick vaginas <laughs> because male ducks are rape monsters, and they they are able to control what uh, semen from other male ducks inseminates their eggs. We are not ducks. We're people. We're also, not ducks. like also like pulling out doesn't work. It's like not a it's not an effective method of birth control. It works better than 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 nothing. Than not, but but uh it it's like it's like marginally better than nothing. Like I had an abortion after a, a pull out situation. Like what? 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 I've got so I've got so many questions. I've got so many. Qu- okay, we can move on to South Carolina now. Sorry, no, sorry. I just I no. Just that was no. That let me tell you something. The duck, that was worth it. Um, So, no, in a, look, Governor Henry McMaster, by the way, every time I read this dude's name, I always think we're talking about that. H.R. McMaster? Yeah, one of the first or seventh national security advisors that Donald (laughs) Trump had in four years. Governor McMaster of South Carolina, he had some words for women with unwanted pregnancies. Quote, life is full of ups and downs, unquote. And also, there are consequences for your actions. Wow. Thank you, South Carolina. That is deep. Uh, I hope that that Mr. McMaster uh, gets in the back of an ambulance, you know, on its way to a car accident and hollers that at people who are in car accidents. Shouldn't have gotten in a car. There are consequences for Shouldn't have gotten in a car. Or like going to a hospital and people are getting treatment for like a heart condition, having heart attacks. Well, you know what? Shouldn't have had that hamburger. Shouldn't have had that hamburger. Shouldn't. Although McMaster does sound like a hamburger. Hamburglar. He sounds like a hamburglar. (laughs) Oh, my God. Uh, (laughs) He should be voted out. There are consequences for actions. And, you know, life is full of ups and downs. Good God, what a smarmy. Which, interestingly, diametrically opposed to what the Tennesseans think, where they're just like homeless people, felonies. I mean, none of them. Here's the thing. They're quite a hypocritical, nonlinear group. <laughs> yeah. Also, like, you know, here's I'm not I'm not being a dick here, but like, doesn't Tennessee have a pretty vibrant outdoor culture? Mm-hmm. Like, is it is it homeless if you're camping? Like, you know what I mean? Like, what's so unclear? It's, it's, it's fine if you're paying to sleep outside in a designated campground in like a, a wilderness area. It's fine if you're wearing a matching Columbia outfit and you have you're making s'mores and like singing campfire songs about you know Jesus or whatever. But it's not fine if you're somebody that's struggling with. I, I don't know. It just, it seems like a little bit of some, it feel, feels like some some mental tension. I'm picking up what you're putting down. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Let's, uh, I think that's all the time we have. I wanted to get into the Biden executive action thing, but I feel you know like. You know what? I'm- I feel like we're better doing that once uh, HHS Secretary Javier Becerra comes back with his report in 30 days. Yeah. I do want to make one quick point about the Biden administration's um, uh, releasing a statement saying, like, you have to give people treatment if they're suffering life-threatening complications of ectopic pregnancy or another type of, um, you know, pregnancy that requires abortion as care. Mm-hmm. Um, here's something that I don't think everyone knows. Catholic hospitals have been turning people away yes for a long time. A lot of Catholic hospitals are huge and span a, a, a ton of territory, especially in rural areas. Um, so I, I appreciate the sentiment behind them saying, well, look, federal law says you must treat people. But the thing is, Catholic hospitals have been 
not actively not doing that for a long time. And, you know, I haven't seen many news stories about Catholic hospitals being sued over this. Maybe th that federal law should be enforced against Catholic hospitals. Um, but that's just, you know, I'm just just throwing that out there. I think anybody that sought any type of reproductive health care at a Catholic hospital can tell you that that's just like they just don't they just won't do it. So they won't do it. No. Nope. So, OK, let's take a quick break when we come back an interview that I am super excited for. Stick around. And welcome back. Our guest today is a retired associate clinical professor at Northwestern University School of Law with a decades long history of advocacy on behalf of women and children. She's also a founder of the Weather Underground and spent several years on the FBI's most wanted list. She's the main subject of Crooked's newest podcast, Mother Country Radicals, which won Best Audio Storytelling in Nonfiction at Tribeca Film Festival 2022. Please welcome Bernadine Dorn. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So let's get started by talking about Mother Country Radicals. What was it like to be interviewed for the podcast? Was it hard to revisit events from so far in the past? Well, let me just first say uh, I was interviewed by my son. I have three sons. I never expected, uh, never exactly planned for, but delightful as it happened. But my oldest son, Zay Dorn, interviewed me maybe a summer, to, a summer or two ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I partly thought it was funny. I partly thought it was thrilling that he was interested in my history and I had no idea where it was going. That's so, I found it to be really interesting that it was you speaking with your son. Did it ever become like awkward or uncomfortable or do you have a relationship where you can talk openly about your past in a way that feels uh, very natural and free? The second <laughs> it feels very natural and free. But I told him at the beginning, you know, that there was going to be several, you know, I can't talk about that. And I think he found that with other people he was interviewing. But um, there were certainly boundaries. Uh, and yet, you know, he's my son. And I was interested that he was interested. And I didn't know. I really didn't know. How embarrassing can I be? What a podcast. <laughs> I, I'd heard podcasts when we were on the road, but I didn't really understand, uh, you know, the the role of it or its, its uh, aesthetic. So, you know, I think he found me and other Weather Underground people who he interviewed and Black Liberation Army people willing to say that's, you know, no more. Can't talk about that. Bernadine, you've been portrayed in the media as a terrorist by conservatives and also as a groundbreaking radical activist. What do you think is different about this media portrayal in Mother Country Radicals? Well, I think you get to hear a variety of women in particular uh, here who are quite open. And I, I, some of the women were interviewers, <laughs> made people comfortable about talking. Uh, and I, I was surprised myself at other of my sisters who uh, I see from time to time still, who were quite open uh, with the people doing the interview and, and in a way uh, eager to think through that history from long ago, from the 70s, really. Do you think this is a more fair or more accurate representation of who you are and what you did? Uh, well, it, you know, more fair than what I'm, I'm pleased with it. I think it's a curious opening and I think it's, um, you don't have to agree with it to listen to it and be curious about how people organized and what we thought we were doing and also what our mistakes were. They're pretty, it's pretty open about all that too. I, you know, I wish we could have more, um, of the insights that we've gotten from today's movements who I think have taken it much farther than we did. And instead of polarizing every issue, although some issues need to be polarized, are more, uh, I don't know what, intersection, inventing the word intersectional for, for me was an enormous breakthrough. You didn't have to pit between the U.S. killing people in Vietnam, you know, 6,000 people a week, year after year in Vietnam, and uh, what women's lives were like in the United States. So finding the ways in which issues are connected has been one of the brilliant things, I think, about your generation's movements. 
So I was listening to the podcast yesterday and all of a sudden I was like halfway through episode five. I just like tore through the, the podcast <laughs> and get, you know, the part at the, at the very beginning, your, your son kind of traces your biography and the, and, and kind of the through line of like rage that was happening among people who cared about their country at, during the time that you were radicalized. And, you know, I was thinking about that overused saying that history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. So is there a rhyme between the events that radicalized you and what's going on in this country right now? And, and what events come to mind when you think of that? Well, I think about the slaughter of, of African-Americans that was, you know, propelled us, certainly propelled me living in Chicago and being there when Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers were murdered by the Chicago Police Department and the FBI. That that kind of thing is a wake up and hard to evade. I knew Fred and, and the Panthers of that moment. So it, I think that is, you can see that happening in big cities and small across the United States still. And I think waking up, you know, lots of people, but particularly white people who've managed to sleep the deep sleep of amnesia sometimes about U.S. history. So I'm I'm very hopeful about your generation. Can I call it your generation? <laughs> uh, and uh, and 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 kind of uh, the notion that we're all implicated. That you have to. Um, it's it's one of the great joys of life to throw yourself in and then realize all the mistakes you've made. <laughs> Um, but to throw yourself into, uh, you know, being on the side of, of freedom and happiness and and uh, love, <laughs> really, and not on the side of, you know, standing by and watching what's done in your name. And we had this passion about what was being done in our name. Bernadine, how do you feel about the weather underground being compared to the insurrectionists who stormed the Capitol on January 6th? revolted. <laughs> I'm revolted <laughs> by the very idea. I mean, there's always been a fascist and neo-fascist uh, movement in the United States, and there always will be. And it's wrapped up uh, in many things, you know, including hatred of women, I think. But it also is, you know, pr primarily white, white power, white supremacy, uh, and the kind of frantic, whole, desperate uh, way of holding on to an America that never was, uh, and it certainly isn't going to be. Um, but it's not uh, the demographic transition that I imagined <laughs> would be happening. But it, it makes sense once you take a hard look. Who was there? Who stormed the Capitol in, in Trump's name? What does that stand for? And I, I think it's very clear now it's not clear where to go, but it is clear what just happened in the last decade. So talking about the last decade, how does your advocacy manifest today if it still does? And if you go to protests, do people recognize you? Sometimes, but not very much. Sometimes, you know, uh, journalists and photographers do, but not not the people there. I've been going to the demonstrations, of course, since the overturning of Roe v. Wade. And, uh, you know, I, I'm thrilled that it's young women and their friends and family members and partners even who are showing up. Uh, so, you know, I, we have a lot to do. Mm -hmm. Do you do you carry a sign when you go to these to the um, Roe v. Wade protests? Yeah, I mean, I usually look at what signs are there. I don't always bring my own. But, um, yeah, I mean. The, the issue of women's right to choose is so critical to, you know, our history. It was um, a very big issue when I first ha was in the first women's group I was ever in in New York City. You know, it, it was a fight then and now we have to fight the fight again. The notion that we're, you know, uh, either to be asexual people or non-sexual people or, you know, to have to um, uh, risk pregnancies that you don't choose is so horrible. And it, for so many people who can't just get on a plane and, you know, go to a doctor in another state, my state in Illinois has welcomed people from the adjoining states. 
but what that means and how to how to do it is not clear. Uh, so we have to get very busy and and overturn this horrible decision immediately. And it's not going to be just a decision, single decision by a single Supreme Court. We have to educate and and the people who are upset about it and who are victimized by it have to have their voices heard. Bernadine, it's the summer of 2022. What brings you hope? Your generation. (laughs) (laughs) And the fact that there's still, you know, feminist uh, activism, that you're on the air, that uh, you're thinking about these questions and, and making them relevant to all the other issues that they link with. I mean, we are, you know, you, we withdraw from one war of murder and slaughter and genocide and immediately are enmeshed in the next war. What is this that the United States is doing in the world? What's being done in our name? I, so I, I think we have to think big uh, about ending war and violence and aggression and invasions and pretending that they're all, we're on the right side of history there. And I think, uh, you know, also we have to take a look at what the U.S. role is uh, economically around the world and, you know, the the incredible wealth that this country has and how few people are in control of it or have access to it. So internal and external, I think we have to, you know, link these issues. And I, I feel like one of the great, you know, breakthroughs was the notion of intersectionality. So how do these, you don't have to be in a corner here with your precious issue. You can actually think big, must think big, and must link it to other issues. Well, thank you so much, Bernadine. Um, Mother Country Radicals is available for streaming everywhere, and it is so good. Well, streaming, it is listening. terrific. It is so good, and it's so good to hear from you, and it's so good to hear from other members of Weather Underground, and, and it's it's really, really eye-opening and interesting. So thank you so much for joining us today, and um, I, I will come back again sometime and talk to us. <laughs> I'd love to. Thanks so much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.